Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on tail talk for the sales market. So today you are going to learn about dealing with animals, as Joe calls them, clients, critters, from accommodations to on-the-job safety. We are lucky today to have Joe Becker with us. Joe is a former Oregon Realtor that was licensed for eight years. Prior to that, for 10 years, she worked for the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. Her focus there was on housing providers such as realtors, property managers, private landlords, etc. Joe has also studied animals and emergency preparedness since 2005. Today, her career consists of public speaking and writing for everyone from the housing industry and utility companies to professional and volunteer disaster responders on topics ranging from critter body language and animals and disaster to on-the-job safety and fair housing. Housing laws. She is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to fair housing issues, but we're going to have a much broader presentation today than just fair housing laws. So as always, send your questions in and Joe will answer them either throughout the presentation or at the end. Take it away, Joe. Thank you so much, and nice to be here, and thank you to everyone who has interest in this participating today. As a former realtor in a family team, my mother and I always loved unexpected encounters with critters in the course of our work. In fact, besides meeting new prospects, sealing a deal, shaking hands over the closing table with happy clients, one of the most fun aspects of the job for us was making friends with critters' clients, as well as pets we met while touring other agents' listings. Those for us were always good days, and as sales professionals, you may come into contact with critters at any time, animals big or small, depending on whether you're involved in real property at all. Of course, a good day also means that no one gets hurt or frightened by those encounters or that any, legal poss any possible legal jeopardies are avoided. So in the time we have together today, I'm going to introduce you to various critter classifications, distinguish between service and assistance animals, review the Fair Housing Act with a focus on disability protections, cover reasonable expectations for disability-related aid animals, as well as offer some tips on etiquette around working animals and out of your head and consider the critter's perspective. Just because you want to pat the animal and this person said it's okay doesn't necessarily mean the animal feels like being touched just then. For all you know, it may have a bellyache or arthritis or just not feel very social. So how do you know? You don't verbally ask the animal, can I pet you? <laughs> so how do you go about that? When I teach humans about critter communications, I compare it to an English as a second language experience. We don't have a shared language. However, we do both use body language, and in fact, we rely on it more heavily than we do verbal cues. This topic as well could be a day-long class, so yet again, I'm painting with broad strokes here. One useful technique to keep in mind is to be aware of the animal's stance. The th three diagrams on the screen look something like a dog or, or a horse, some nondescript four-legged critter. In the first drawing, the animal's stance is neutral. However, in the second drawing, the animal's leaning back, away from whatever or whoever is in front of it. This stance should be a conscious indication to you that the animal is either afraid or simply shy. If you are the thing in front of the animal making it uncomfortable and you continue to approach, the critter has three options. Turn and run if there's an escape route available to it, submit to you, or attack. If the animal feels cornered and can't run, you may find that in a split second it changes from leaning back in fear to lunging forward and attack in order to protect itself or its space. The third drawing shows uh, just such a forward-leaning posture in which the critter is either assertive or maybe aggressive. At the very least, it's interested in what or who is in front of it. Just because the animal's interested in leaning forward does not mean it's about to attack. It may have instantaneously decided that you're its new best friend and it can't wait to lick your face and play ball with you. In either case, the stance is an example of body language that you should be paying attention to in your daily encounters, regardless of the classification of the animal. It really doesn't matter if it's a household pet or livestock on rural property or an aid animal. So there you are, clients in tow, with an unexpected and perhaps unsupervised host waiting for you at your 2 o'clock tour appointment. Let's break down the anatomy of a friendly approach using this pooch as an example. And again, it doesn't matter if this is a, a pet or an assistance animal of some sort. Approach with your eyes averted. That is, turn your head and look at the animal from the corner of your eyes. For an animal that doesn't know and trust you, 
as well as those that are sick and injured, this is a much, much less intimidating uh, way to, to look at the animal than to look at them straight on. Keep your hands down to your side. Hands and arms are scary beasts. They can grab and hold and constrain and confine. Truth be told, our hands are weapons, just like the talons on an eagle or the claws on a mountain lion. Now, our digits have evolved over time and they're not very sharp or useful for cutting and ripping flesh, but I challenge you to get out of your own head and consider it from the critter's perspective. Unless you've come to know, they've, they've come to know and trust you, each of those fingers looks, I imagine, like a very long, very sharp claw from across the room or across the pasture. For, so for goodness sake, don't wave your arms or show off your weapons. Keep them down and to your side. Be mindful of your tone of voice. Um, first, you don't want to excite the animal by amping up its energy level. Calm is good. That said, there is a reason that we talk baby talk to man's best friend. It turns out that an average man's voice sounds like a reprimand to a dog, um, and frankly, even women's voices, but men in particular, sounds like a reprimand. Doesn't matter what the man's saying, his gestures or body language, just the, that lower register tone of voice can be a reprimand. Um, so when we're talking baby talk, the animal's less, much less intimidated and much more positively responsive. So you know, demonstrating typical, oh, it's, it's a good dog, you're so beautiful, look at that beautiful red color, and you're going to let me into the, into the house today so we can see it, right? Good dog! You know, it sounds stupid, but don't worry about being stupid, better safe than sorry. Elevate your voice, particularly if you're a man, even, I, I, even if you're a woman, and use that high-pitched voice as you're uh, approaching the animal. Move slowly and allow the critter to the option of closing the distance if it wants to interact. Never rush in and corner an unfamiliar or scared animal, if at all possible, and give it always leave it a, a viable exit strategy. Extend your hand in greeting. This allows the dog to get your scent. Now, again, I'm going through this in rapid fashion. There's more that could be said about all of this, including ways to hold your hand that protects the fingers if the dog does turn and bite, ways to reach out that are less likely to be perceived um, as threatening. But in the time we have today, suffice it today, to, to say that slow, respectful, with calm energy, a high voice, and an indirect gaze is best. The reason all of this is so important has to do with an aspect I don't hear other people talking about. It boils down to key predator-prey distinctions and the fact that humans have all the characteristics of a predator animal. We can be assured that critters around us don't miss these predator cues. If it's your beloved pooch in question, she's no doubt gotten used to your tone of voice and learned to trust you and knows that you gesture with your hands and realize that those long fingers feel really good when they scratch your back. But until that familiarity and in, in, in trust is built, all bets are off. So as you're encountering this strange pooch on an appointment, uh, don't assume it's going to look aside, or, uh, look beyond your scary, intimidating predator traits and, and read your intentions as innocent and, and helpful. The more we recognize those predator traits and consciously choose to play them up or play them down in the given situation and our aim in that moment, the better and safer our inner species communications will be. So I, I've given you a taste of a class I teach on critter communications and body language that I call deciphering doggy dialects, cracking the kitty code, and honing your horse sense, aimed at enhancing bonds with your own animals and maintaining safety around others' critters. Related to animals, I also, also teach a class on emergency preparedness for the whole family focused on how and why to prepare for animals great and small. And